Hi everyone and welcome to this video that I've created as part of Virtual Gen Con 2023. So after finishing watching this video, don't forget to check out the other videos of the convention. So this video is based on an oral presentation I did back in 2016 in my Masters of uh, English Studies. In this video, I propose to talk about one sentence from Pride and Prejudice. Well, actually, we're going to read more sentences than one from the book, but uh, it all starts with this one in particular. So that's when, at the end, well, I'm going to spoil a little bit Pride and Prejudice, but I don't think that's a problem here. Uh, Jane asks Lizzie, will you tell me how long you have loved him? About Darcy, obviously. And Lizzie answers, it has been coming on so gradually that I hardly know when it began. But I believe it must date. I must date it from my first seeing his beautiful grounds at Pemberley. So to me that begs the question, is Lizzie's remark to Jane about Darcy's beautiful grounds at Pemberley really out of character? I mean, she doesn't strike me as the pers as the kind of person who goes after money. Clearly, she isn't. Clearly, she says no. She said no to his pr first proposal. So, did she actually fall in love with him because his house is grand? Mind you, she already knew. Like I said, he was crazy rich, so it doesn't make much sense. Or maybe the remark is ironic, which is kind of Lizzie's style anyway. Well, what if I told you that she actually had not one, but two good reasons to fall in love with Darcy when seeing Pemberley? But to explain all that, I must first talk about the management of country states in England at the turn of the 19th century. So in the 18th century, a lot of things changed in the management of country states in England. First, there was the agricultural revolution. It consisted of rationalizing the agriculture through the implementation of new systems such as crop rotation, uh, selective breeding of, life, of livestock, and focusing on the management of agricultural lands by wealthy families through the implementation of the Enclosure Act of 1727, for example, which put an end to the open field system and uh, there was also the implementation of the entail system to ensure that estates were passed on intact to the next generation without fragmentation for the purpose of sharing between several heirs. The agricultural revolution led to increasing, increasing food production and a huge population growth as well, and it was mostly led not by the conservative landed aristocracy, but rather by the newly rich merchants became, uh, become landed gentry. Now, at the same time as the agricultural fields of an estate underwent huge changes, so did the park around the house, with the development of English gardens, also called landscape gardens, as opposed to the French or geometric garden, think Versailles. Landscape gardens were uh, as artificial as geometric gardens, but they were supposed to look beautifully natural. They consisted in recreating a false, a false sensation sorry, of highly aesthetical yet natural looking environment through the creation of artificial hills, valleys, forests, uh, the use of sinuous paths in the forest, etc. etc. The one word encapsulating the feeling of a landscape garden is the word picturesque, that it, we, uh, which means that which resembles and has the qualities of a painting. For example, Sir Uvedale Price said that the picturesque comes from the irregular, from irregularity, abruptness, and creates striking effects. That's why landscape gardens were much inspired by landscape paintings and attempted to recreate beautiful scenes worthy of being painted. Uh, think, for example, at the turn um, of the path, you suddenly come upon a breathtaking view onto the valley below. That's picturesque, that's worthy of being painted. For instance, Reverend William Gilpin describes Stowe Gardens as a, as a succession of paintings. Conversely, uh, several paintings by John Constable are picturesque views of real country estates. Yeah. Now, landscape gardens became popular as part of what was called estate improvement, which is the renovation of the house and man or mansion and of the gardens well. In Jane Austen's time, there was a societal debate on how to rightly improve an estate, and books were published about it, and we know that Jane Austen read them and that she had definite opinions on the matter. For instance, in a treatise in verse in three volumes, uh, Mr. Richard Payne Knight explained how improvement must reflect the estate's owner's taste, but also be efficient, it must make sense, it must show rationality. 
Remember the rationalization of, of agriculture at the same time. This is all linked together. So improvements should uh, not only serve to showcase the owner's status and wealth and taste uh, or flatter their pride, but it should also show rationality, a good management of land in general. For Jane Austen in particular, the negative social implications of a particular mode of improvement are more important than its aesthetic merits. So it has to be tasteful, but most importantly, it has to uh, have merits in terms of land management. Alistair M. Duckworth uh, wrote a whole book about improvement in Jane Austen's work, and this is the main source for this video thesis. According to Duckworth, uh, throughout Jane's, Jane Austen's fiction, Estates function not only as the settings of action, but as indexes to the character and social responsibility of their owners. So there is a direct link between the way an estate is managed and the personality, whether it's good or bad, uh, and the morality of a character, especially a male character, the owner of the land. So basically, in, um, in her works, Jane Austen talks a lot about society and her depiction of uh, the micro-society of the country estate and the surrounding villages and farms works as a mirror of society as a whole. To understand her view on society, and more specifically on ruling, on the managing of the land, once again, one must therefore take a look at who is a good estate manager, and that's where we go back to Lizzie falling in love with Pemberley. So let's read together the description of Pemberley estate. Um, sorry in advance for my bad reading and uh, my accent. I'm obviously not a native English speaker, I'm French. But anyway, here comes and you can read the text on, uh, on the screen as well if you want. Elizabeth, Elizabeth's mind was too full for conversation, but she saw and admired every remarkable spot and point of view. They gradually ascended for half a mile and then found themselves at the top of a considerable eminence where the wood ceased and the eye was instantly caught by Pemberley House, situated on the opposite side of the valley, into which the road with some abruptness wound. It was a large, handsome stone building, standing well on rising ground and backed by a ridge of high woody hill, and in front of a stream of some natural importance was swelled into greater but without any artificial appearance. Its banks were neither formal nor falsely, falsely adorned. Elizabeth was delighted. She had never seen a place for which nature had done more or where natural beauty had been so little counteracted by an awkward taste. So we can see here that Pemberley is a model estate. The grounds are pleasing without extravagance. There is a breathtaking, picturesque view onto the house and it is described as very tasteful. This description is then built upon by the housekeeper when she describes Mr. Darcy as the best landlord that ever lived. The description of the estate therefore serves here as a description of Darcy's social and moral character, which show uh, through the establishment of the fact that he is, again, a good and tasteful landowner. Duckworth comments further by saying, that when Elizabeth comes to explain to her to exclaim to herself that to be mistress of Pemberley might be something, she has, we might conjecture, uh, come to recognize not merely the money and the status of Pemberley, but its value as the setting of a traditional social and ethical orientation, its possibilities, seemingly now only hypothetical, as a context for her responsible social activity. So what that means is that Eliz Lizzie, which is uh, much below um, Darcy in not exactly status but wealth, through marrying Dice, but Darcy, by marrying Darcy, could access to becoming the, uh, the mistress of Pemberley, and as such, she could have the opportunity to contribute to society by being a model uh, landowner as well, or the landowner's wife. Duckworth then goes on to analyse this excerpt. Uh, Elizabeth, after slightly surveying it, went to a window to enjoy its prospects. The hill, crowned with woods, from which they had descended, receiving increasing, increasing abruptness from the distance, was a beautiful object. Every disposition of the ground was good, and she looked on the whole scene, uh, the river, the trees scattered on its banks, and the winding of the valley as far as she could trace it, with delight. As they passed into other rooms, these objects were taking different positions, 
but from every window there were beauties to be seen. And so this scene is actually a metaphor for the entire novel and its thesis about prejudice. Indeed, just as Lizzie only saw one part of Darcy in Meryton and then another part at Rosings Park, in this scene she cannot see the whole park at once from the window. And uh, each window, sorry, shows her a different view, a different point of view, a different aspect. Uh, distance also increases abruptness of the hill, just like Darcy is more abrupt in the social environment that makes him uncomfortable, surrounded by strangers. So from far away, uh, socially, he seems more abrupt. However, just like the hill, he is a beautiful object if seen from closer from a more acquainted uh, position. It is important to note that good estate owners in Jane Austen's work are from the landed gentry, not from the aristocracy. Members of the aristocracy, such as Lady Catherine or uh, Sir Walter from Persuasion, tend to focus on stature, status and uh, appearances. Just look at how Lizzie compares Pemberley and Rosings Park. The rooms were lofty and handsome, and their furniture suitable to the fortune of their proprietor. But Elizabeth saw, with admiration of his taste, that it was neither gaudy nor uselessly fine, with less of splendour and more real elegance than the furniture of Rosings. So Darcy and Lady Catherine are from the same family, um, but clearly Darcy has better taste, and uh, because it's more elegant, more real, it has more real elegance, but it's less uh, ostentatious. Therefore, uh, we can see that despite her proto-feminist views in favour of a better education for women, for example, which make uh, Jane Austen a real progressive in her time, in her novel, she also depicts a need to maintain a certain social status quo um, when it comes to ruling the ruling of the land. Uh, and so basically for her, an, an educated elite must be in charge of the organization of society in a time in which there was a decline uh, in rule that was being felt at the turn of the 19th century. And Austen's solution to this decline is to shift the responsibility of rule from the aristocracy, who have failed and are shown to be failing in her novels, even though they are very uh, little present. So shifting the responsibility of rule from the aristocracy, who have failed, to the rising gentry. Heroes such as Darcy and Mr. Knightley seem to represent the desirable future of England within Jane Austen's work. So thank you so much for watching this video. Uh, you can find me mostly on Instagram. My handle name is LinguiPixie. If you enjoyed this video, don't hesitate to check out uh, last virtual Jane Con's video on my channel, uh, in which I talk about how much men and women speak in Pride and Prejudice and also in Anne Radcliffe's the Mysteries of Adolfo, and then I explain uh, what it tells us about women and women authors at the turn of the 19th century. Like I said before, don't forget to check out the other videos published for Virtual Jane Con in general. Uh, they all sound amazing and I can't wait to watch them myself.